When we think about restoring soils and ecosystems today, we often look forward to new technologies and new ideas. But to truly understand the present, we need the context of history. Going back 20,000 years, the world looked very different. Locked in a deep ice age, with average global temperatures dipping as low as 9 degrees Celsius. Vast ice sheets stretched across much of North America, Europe and Asia. But beyond the glaciers, life thrived. Immense grasslands, sprawling steppes and open woodlands blanketed the continents which were some of the most productive ecosystems the planet has ever seen. One of the most famous was the Mammoth Steppe, a biome resembling the African savanna. It stretched from the Iberian Peninsula across Eurasia and into North America, making it the largest terrestrial biome at the time. It was so productive and rich that it supported an abundance of animal life unimaginable today. Steppe ecosystems were extremely resilient and stable. Since they developed over hundreds of thousands of years and survived several deep glaciations and warm periods, high animal density allowed only grasses to be the dominant vegetation, where for example in just one square kilometer in the northern region of the Mammoth Steppe, there was one mammoth five bison, six horses, and ten reindeer as an example. The number of animals in the southern steppe was significantly higher of course, but a global extinction of animals was about to take place comparable to the previous mass extinctions in history, leading to the collapse of the mammoth steppe. Fast forward to today and our ecosystems look nothing like they once did. Biodiversity and ecosystem health are at an all-time low. So what happened? What happened to the great megafauna populations and what can this ancient ecosystem tell us about ecosystem processes and our degraded nature? Our agriculture is producing around 75 billion tons of eroding soil each year. That's around 10 tons of eroding soil per person. Now what in the world has that to do with the mammoth steppe? Restoring soils and ecosystems are at utmost priority in our modern day. And when we dive into the deep past, into the Pleistocene, certain insights emerge that could help us turn things around. Scientists debate why the megafauna disappeared. There being two accepted hypotheses. The climate hypothesis suggests that as the ice age ended, rapid warming changed ecosystems too fast for large animals to adapt. The biggest problem with this hypothesis is the mammoth steppe and its megafauna managed to survive nearly 3 million years of glacial and interglacial fluctuations without any problem to all of a sudden fully disappear all at once. The period that lines up with the disappearance of megafauna also matches the timeline of human expansion and hunting. Hence most evidence supports the hunting hypothesis that human arrival with growing populations, advanced hunting tools and strategies caused the steep decline by overhunting vulnerable megafauna. It created a feedback loop. Decreased megafauna led to an increased encroachment of trees, reducing food availability, further reducing megafauna numbers. Okay, with that out of the way, Homo sapiens evolved in Africa around 200 to 300,000 years ago. There, animals co-evolved with us, developing behaviors like avoidance and aggression, which helped them survive our growing hunting abilities. This forced us to create smarter and more diverse hunting strategies. About 40,000 years ago, as glaciers temporarily retreated, Homo sapiens began migrating north into new environments. They found themselves in a grassland landscape, the Mammoth Steppe, that felt surprisingly familiar. Open plains, herds of large animals, just like the African savanna, but colder and hairier. Woolly rhinoceros, mammoths, cave lions, and ancient horses roamed these lands. But unlike African animals, these Eurasian creatures had no evolutionary history with Homo sapiens. They didn't know to fear us. With their growing population, new technologies, and advanced hunting strategies, humans targeted the largest animals first, megafauna provided the most calories for the effort, and over time, this heavy hunting pressure caused a gradual but devastating decline in megafauna populations, eventually contributing to the collapse of the mammoth steppe ecosystem. But this extinction wasn't isolated. 
In Australia, after human arrival, about 82% of megafauna species vanished. In North America, about 83% disappeared after humans crossed onto the continent. In South America, roughly 72% were lost shortly after human arrival. This pattern, human arrival followed by megafauna collapse, repeats worldwide. Even when modern-day Europeans arrived in North America, they only saw remnants of what once was. But even so, explorers like Meriwether Lewis wrote, the whole face of the country was covered with buffalo, elk, deer, and antelopes. The moving multitude darkened the whole plains. But even then, that was only a shadow of a forgotten time. Current perception of most modern people believe the Arctic is an intact piece of wild nature. However, real wild ecosystems were destroyed by humans over 10,000 years ago. Current animal density in the Arctic is at least 100 times lower than during the Pleistocene. But when we look at the great grasslands of the world, we often see them form in areas higher on the brittleness scale, meaning these are areas of the world where biological decay is halted for extended periods over the year. This can be due to extended periods of dryness, such as in the African savanna, or even during the extended periods of very cold temperatures. Hence, this is why grasslands and grazing animals are inseparable. Grazing animals through their microorganisms in their gut are able to biologically cycle plant material rapidly into dung and urine, increasing the productivity of the land. After large megafauna populations in the Mammoth Steppe declined majorly due to overhunting, the result was millions of square kilometers of grasslands were left without their symbiotic partner. Summer grasses that growed in the summer wasn't grazed or trampled, and was left out as litter on the soil surface. Microorganisms in the soil during the limited summer period of the year were unable to deal with the buildup of plant material. Similar to dryland grasslands, without the disturbance of animals, grasses in the mammoth steppe began to slowly oxidize and cover the soil, preventing new growth and new shoots from emerging. This weakening led to transpiration decreasing, causing an increase in soil moisture and runoff. And to top it off, without the grazing megafauna, sprouts of shrubs, mosses and trees weren't trampled, where over a few centuries, the richest steppe ecosystem was replaced by low biodiversity boreal forests. Now what if I told you that the extinction of megafauna leads us with a problem so big that makes us care a little more about the overhunting of these animals? Permafrost. Permafrost is soil that stays frozen year-round, trapping massive amounts of dead organic material underground. So this is like a typical permafrost cave. Many fishermen build, well, much smaller versions, but like little cave for themselves to put fish which they caught in the summer. As you can see here on the wall, there is a little pieces of roots of grass, which are 30,000 years old when they preserved the permafrost. And as soon as this melts, microbes will awaken. There is like lots of frozen, like sleeping microbes there. And they will start eat. They were starving for 20,000 years, 30,000 years. And now they awaken like, oh, we want to eat. And they start producing greenhouse gases. It is one of the largest carbon reservoirs with estimates suggesting 1.4 to 1.6 trillion tons of carbon stored in the Arctic permafrost. Or in other words, that is two times the carbon currently in Earth's atmosphere. Yeah, that's a big problem. Permafrost covers roughly 11% of Earth's land currently. As global temperatures rise, permafrost reservoirs become increasingly at risk for thawing. So we are sitting on an enormously big carbon bomb. So the idea is like to find a way to leave this enormously big reservoir of carbon intact. During Arctic summers, air temperatures can reach up to 30 degrees Celsius, thawing some of the soil. This is a natural part of the seasonal cycle. Yet in winter though, a thick layer of snow blankets the ground, insulating it from the freezing air. So even when air temperatures drop to negative 40 degrees Celsius, the soil remains relatively mild, around negative 5 degrees Celsius, because of the snow's insulating effect. 
the problem? If the soil isn't exposed to the Arctic's harsh freezing temperatures each winter, a dangerous cycle begins where every year more permafrost thaws than refreezes, leading to the gradual release of the largest soil organic carbon reservoir in the world, releasing massive amounts of greenhouse gases, accelerating climate change. In the winter, it's very cold outside, but we have a snow cover. So this half meter of snow is a great heat insulator. So no matter how cold it is in winter, under the snow it will be way warm. To keep it like frozen, you need to uh, cool it very well in the winter. And how can you do that? You can like, I don't know, buy million bulldozers and bulldoze all the Arctic and plow all the snow into piles. However, I'm afraid that this may create kind of like negative carbon footprint. But there is one environmentally friendly way to do that. Now this is where the animals come in. The grazing, trampling and disturbance of grazing animals break the insulating snow layer. This exposes the ground to harsh arctic winter, helping preserve and even regrow permafrost. Research shows that where grazing animals have trampled the snow, soil temperatures are able to go down to negative 30 degrees celsius, refreezing parts that thawed and securing existing permafrost. This is exactly what Pleistocene Park in Siberia is trying to replicate and is demonstrating. So instead of using bulldozers, they are reintroducing large wild herbivores to bring back the ancient ecosystem processes that stabilize climate and landscape for millennia, and ultimately helping to prevent the release of the permafrost carbon bomb. By reintroducing animals like the Yakutian horse, muskox, bison, yaks, and many more animals, they will trample the insulating snow, opening up the landscape and allowing grasses to thrive again, eventually reviving the highly productive and biodiverse ecosystem that once was. The removal of grazing megafauna from the world's brittle environments led to two different yet very parallel ecological consequences. In dry brittle grasslands, the absence of animal impact and disturbance caused landscapes to degrade into desert, a process driven by plant oxidation. See our previous video on plant oxidation to learn more. Meanwhile, in cold, brittle Arctic regions, the loss of large herbivores allowed boreal forests to encroach into former grasslands, decreasing productivity, biodiversity, and accelerating permafrost thaw. These outcomes highlight how deeply misunderstood livestock and ruminants are. Rather than being climate villains, their role in ecosystem function is essential, especially in brittle environments where biological decay is limited for much of the year. One common misconception today, and one I had myself, is the idea that forests are always the pinnacle of biodiversity and ecosystem health. In some cases, like tropical rainforests, that's true, but not everywhere. We hear of the abundant tree planting projects all around the world to restore the environment, especially in the colder and more arid regions of the world where environmental degradation has taken place. It was actually the grasslands, not the forests that supported the richest communities of life. Not only that, unlike forests, which store most of their carbon above ground in trunks and branches, Grasslands store the majority of their carbon below ground, in dense root systems and rich soil organic matter. Grasslands are not just seas of grass. In healthy systems, they often form mosaics, wide open plains dotted with scattered older growth trees, shrubs, wetlands, and rivers. These mixed landscapes created an incredible edge habitat that supported a huge diversity of species, grazers, browsers, predators, birds, insects, fungi. Additionally, our most productive agricultural lands were once the world's great grasslands with rich soil organic matter, which we've greatly relied upon for decades. The disappearance of megafauna has led to huge environmental changes all over the world. Without the impact of large herds of animals, we are seeing environmental degradation in the northern polar regions with boreal forests and melting permafrosts all the way down to the desertification of brittle, arid environments. The environmental crisis did not only start 100 years ago with the Industrial Revolution, but it began more than 20,000 years ago 
when rampant overhunting and extinction of grazing megafauna changed the face of ecosystems around the world. There is like lots of international programs on like saving the nature, like protection, and there is nothing to protect. Before you have to protect something, you have to create something. There is no wild nature. Contrasting many modern day beliefs, animal integration with the right management is essential. Ecological processes don't care about what we humans believe, they simply respond to their environment. Such as in Pleistocene Park, where the reintroduction of large grazers are kick-starting a positive feedback loop, promoting the re-establishment of the once extremely biodiverse mammoth steppe, while addressing and preventing permafrost thawing. By learning from the past and studying the ecosystem processes that once shaped landscapes like the mammoth steppe, we can gain valuable insights into how to build agricultural and ecological systems that thrive through climatic extremes. Restoring ecosystems isn't about nostalgia. It's about understanding the natural processes that once made regenerating carbon-rich soils, which we have built our civilization upon. If life will be unpredictable, unstable, untypical, there is only one type of ecosystem which is not sensitive for changing of temperature, precipitation, everything. It's grassland ecosystem. In the past, this ecosystem was biggest in our planet. African savanna, mama steppe, pasture ecosystem, it was everywhere. If you want to learn more about the work they're doing at Pleistocene Park, I would highly recommend you check out their website and the many videos on YouTube. Thank you for watching.